And um, again, just to welcome, I think most people were here, a few people knew. This is really a chance to bring together different disciplines and perspectives to think about the unique opportunities for science to advance uh, behavior change. And we're particularly interested in these two periods of the lifespan, adolescence and transition to old age, as, as sort of attractors for bringing interdisciplinary groups together and thinking about unique opportunities for positive behavioral change. We're going to continue with a series of talks today and a brainstorming session at the end of the day today. And really looking forward to people just Letting our guards down, being open, having a really rich discussion about uh, some of these ideas and, and sharing different perspectives. Uh, and I think, who's going to introduce? Oh, and yeah. Vauder is going to introduce. <clears throat> OK, so it's my great honor to uh, introduce the first speaker of today, which is Valerie Reyna. She's a professor of uh, human development and psychology at Cornell. But she's also co-director of the imaging facility and uh, the Center for uh, Behavioral Economics and Decision Research and recently also became the director of the Neuroscience Institute. And I think that greatly reflects uh, her expertise over all these different levels. And that's why I'm greatly looking forward to our talk today. Thank you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. I uh, have enjoyed the meeting so far immensely, and I want to thank the uh, organizers for getting together this uh, diverse group of people to have a real scholarly uh, exchange. It's been delightful. So I am going to tell you what I'm going to tell you first, of course. Uh, that, by the way, is a, a, is a plug for a book I published last year, an edited volume on the adolescent brain. Um, and uh, it has a collection of uh, of uh, chapters by people from different disciplines, just like this group, including neuroscientists, economists, psychologists, and folks in education. So a few take home messages, uh, just so in anyone wants to nod off after the first couple of slides, you'll at least maybe take home some message. Um, one of our main um, uh, theoretical premises, and I should say, by the way, that all of the assumptions that I'm going to talk about, assumptions, are theoretical assumptions that have been tested in experiments. They've often been tested in mathematical models, for example, models of recall and recognition and decision making and so on. Uh, those mathematical models have been further tested for goodness of fit to data, you know, data rule. Um, and also, the manipulations, the experimental manipulations, have been examined for their effects on these parameters. But you'll be pleased to know I'm not going to be talking about mathematical models today. Um, but I want you to know that at least that there is an empirical backdrop to the claims that I'm, be, that I'm going to be making today. So um, some of our core assumptions are that there are developmental differences across the lifespan in the kinds of mental representation, verbatim and gist, that people lean on in cognition, including risky decision making. Uh, verbatim and gist uh, memory abilities or faculties increase from childhood to adulthood, to young adulthood. They go up. But usually, just increases more rapidly than from childhood to adulthood. And this creates a lot of um, kind of fascinating paradoxes having to do with false memory, in which you get more false memory um, in adults, net, than you get in children. So children are technically more accurate, which is kind of a cool effect. Uh, judgment and decision making preferentially relies on this gist representation. And by the way, you may be thinking to yourself, what is a gist representation? A gist representation is what you think it is. It is the bottom line essential meaning of information. And we're going to get into more details about it. Whereas the verbatim is the just the surface form, the exact words, the exact numbers. Laboratory tasks often load on verbatim, meaning that they're designed in such a way that if you're a really good computer, you'll do well at the task. However, real life, I would like to claim, and this is a bit of an inductive leap, but nevertheless, real life, on the other hand, often revolves around getting the gist of information, the essential bottom line meaning of information. We often control for that and control it away in our laboratory tasks, but that does not necessarily reflect the kinds of information processing people do in the real world. And then finally, gist shapes emotion and motivation. And I think you know many people who do uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, who are engaged in real life interventions with people, know that the way you think about your options, the way you conceptualize them or frame them, 
indicates or, or has an effect on and shapes the emotions that you feel about them. Now, naturally, these directions of influence go in both directions. Emotion influences the gist, and that's been shown. But gist also influences the, mo the emotion and the motivation to take risks. So I'm going to give you a little hint that we've actually applied some of these things in practical contexts. Um, in looking at behavioral change, because I know that this network is interested in behavioral change, and I think it's a, a terrific um, organizing theme. Um, I did uh, a study with a wonderful rheumatologist from Yale, Leanna Frankel, with real patients applying some of these ideas about gist versus verbatim. And what we did is we took these complicated uh, arthritis medications, and we extracted what the bottom line gist was of them. You know, small risk, big risk, uh, that sort of thing. And we presented them uh, in an online tutorial that was about an hour, hour and a half. And these are real patients. And the concern of the rheumatologist was that they were not taking the medications that were really right for them. And she was trying to explain the medications. Again, she's really an expert. And even one of her patients who was a physician, she felt, did not get the risk and wasn't taking the right stuff. So we implemented this fuzzy trace theory kind of uh, version of uh, this um, arthritis decision tool. And all we did was take the information, this complicated risk information, justify it, make it you know, what's the bottom line of the, of the risk and, and the benefits of the medications. And it only took about an hour and a half. And the value concordant choices of the real patients went from 35% beforehand, this is their values, what they feel is important, to 64% after the intervention. So we, we kind of were encouraged by that, and we're going to follow that up. So um, there's two elements, essentially, to these interventions. One of them is the mental representation that you use. Do you get the bottom line of the information that's being presented to you? That's the representation. The other key element in behavior change here is retrieving your values in context. Now, it may seem very obvious that if you hold a value dear, that you would think of it when your options are before you. Right? So you value your family. Of course you're going to think of your family as you're making this decision about medication that's going to maintain your functionality as a parent, for example. But that's not true. It turns out empirically you have to be sometimes reminded of your core values, and you have to be helped in applying your values to the concrete situation. So this particular hour and a half implementation tried to do both of those things. We also went to expert physicians and experienced patients and said, what are the gist of these medications to you? And so we got, what are the values that you think are relevant? And we made lists and we vetted them and, and checked them. And this was the result. There's also a, um, <clears throat> a randomized control trial that I've done with adolescents, high, high school students, in which we took an existing curriculum called Reducing the Risk. This is Kirby's curriculum. This has been shown to be efficacious in reducing sexual risk taking. So things like uh, unprotected sex or early initiation of sex with many partners, that sort of thing, among young people. So we took an existing curriculum and we justified it. Again, we focused on these two main things, the representation of information in the curriculum in terms of the bottom line gist. So each lesson was accompanied by, and the bottom line is, right? I made sure that the students got that. It was about 14 contact hours. And we randomly assigned uh, a group that got the standard reducing the risk, which is efficacious, reducing the risk plus, which was the justified curriculum. It also, again, stressed values and retrieving your values in context and applying them and a control group that would talked about nutrition and things like that. Actually, no, it was a friendship control, but it was an unrelated control group. And what we found is we followed up people for up to a year, and we found that out of 26 outcome variables, including psychosocial mediators, there were significant effects of 19 on them compared to the control group. And in fact, as it says here, after one year, um, uh, first of all, RTR Plus was significantly improved over the standard curriculum for nine outcomes, and it remains significantly better than controls after 12 months. So this is long-term retention. And I know a lot of us are concerned about fade out, and this was mentioned yesterday, about how, and this is true across the board of interventions, public health interventions, Head Start interventions, educational interventions. We always worry about fade out. Right? And if especially and if you're giving therapy to people, right? You don't want them to just remember in the therapy session what you say. You want them to be able to carry that forward into their life and apply it. 
just has the advantage that it's retained over a long-term retention interval. Again, we've done these sort of, you know, Markov models of long-term retention, et cetera. But the bottom line is that gist, as opposed to verbatim mental representations, are carried with you over time across long-term um, intervals, and therefore, it's more likely to be sustained in its effect. All right, so those are just sort of bottom line take home messages. I got to show a picture of the brain because it's such a colorful, nice thing. <laughs> this is the famous adolescent uh, brain that Jay Geed and colleagues um, did many, many scans, multiple scans, and Adriana Galvan has uh, you know, done a lot of important work on this, and she, she uh, told us about that yesterday. Um, Basically, um, I, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, uh, just do, using this as a mental placeholder to tell you that some of the changes in the brain that, have, that we've discovered over the last decade or so are really surprising from the perspective of standard approaches. I mean, very few people really expected the brain to change much in adolescence. And the fact that it changes radically, it's radically remodeled in this period of time when we thought development was pretty much done in the brain is amazing. And that the nature of the change would be pruning is also surprising. I mean, it's not completely surprising if you know about neural development, you know, Ubel and Wiesel and all that stuff. But still, that lots of the brain would be lost that's kind of amazing that that would be the nature of what happens. But if you think of it in a kind of loose metaphorical way as you know, getting more spare as a result of experience, um, being more connected but more simple, the brain, the metaphor kind of works for just. So, and plus it's a nice picture. All right, so why do people take risks? That's one of the themes of, of the work that I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna, you know, go across various age groups and so on. I'm going to talk about laboratory tasks, and then I'm going to connect them to self-reported real-world risk-taking and at different ages. So the standard you know, answer to, you know, why would you, would you play Russian roulette for a million dollars? Would you play Russian roulette for a million dollars? She's shaking her head no, very short latency. <laughs> Good, You're, we're very, very pleased. That's pretty normal, right? But you know, if we raise the stakes, like a billion dollars, would you play? No, very short latency. She, I don't, did you calculate the expected value there? I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> All right, so you know the, the theoretical uh, notion from behavioral economics, and many, many psychologists agree with this too, and decision neuroscientists, is that you ought to be thinking about the pros and cons. Right? You ought to be weighing the probabilities and the outcomes. Now, we could say, and some economists have said this to me, well, this is, uh, has infinite disutility. Death has infinite disutility. That means it's really, really bad. <laughs> and yes, it is, right? But, um, you know, there ought to be a number at which, and it's really not a question of which answer you pick, it's the nature of your thinking. And one of the things that I'm going to talk about is how young people think about those types of choices. Would you have unprotected sex, risking HIV, and so on and so forth? It's the nature of the thought process, not necessarily really the answer that we're interested in. So Russian roulette, yes or no? Well, on the one hand, you could have a verbatim approach to this would be computational rote. You know the math. It's one out of six. How many dollars? How many bullets? You know, is it only six? It's only, you know, six chambers in this revolver. Hmm, one out of six. The odds are with me. Or you could say, are you kidding? The are you kidding answer is a kind of qualitative categorical, like your very fast nod, right? It's not a consideration of the details. And that is the essential difference in the processing here. The way a computer would approach it would be more like verbatim analysis. And the way people, mature adults, approach these kinds of risks would be more like the are you kidding, right? So, so that's verbatim, of course, and that's just. And by the way, I should tell you the translation. I mentioned fuzzy trace theory a couple of times. What are fuzzy traces? All I mean by fuzzy traces are these gist representations as opposed to verbatim. I want to make sure my terms are at least somewhat transparent. So fuzzy trace theory differs from the classical trading off risks and benefits, and that's sort of the, the standard public health approach, the standard expected utility approach on the one hand, on the other hand. Um, and we say that you encode parallel representations of reality. You encode both verbatim and gist. So you have them both in your working memory as you're thinking about your options and trying to make a decision. But if you're a mature adult, you rely mainly on this bottom line gist, especially if the verbatim answer is these are equivalent mathematically or roughly equivalent, but even when they're not sometimes. 
And as you get more experienced in a domain, and from childhood to adulthood, children get, um, and young people become more experienced in the domain of life, they get more and more of this fuzzy processing preference, this gist-based reasoning. And in particular, we argue, and this is very different than from standard dual process. You know, standard dual process is this cognition versus emotion kind of duality. And we think that there's a lot to be said for that duality. The work in that tradition has contributed very important um, concepts, like impulsivity in adolescence. But this is different. When we say intuition, we don't mean impulsive. Yes, young people are impulsive, too. But in addition to that, the nature of their thought processes is different. They're actually contemplating the Russian roulette. That's a different kind of cognitive process that's going on. The manner of thinking is different in addition to the impulsivity being different. All right, are you kidding? So just to define turns pretty quickly, I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly, but do stop me if I say something and you're like, what is she saying? That may be for the whole talk, but, <laughs> but do raise your hand. So we t we're talking about memory. Memory is much more than just memorizing things, right? We think memory, we think memory. But actually memory, even when you can see your options in front of you, so if you're in the doctor's office and you're looking at the brochure, you know, am I gonna have this procedure or not? You're looking right at it. Nevertheless, you're using your memory because you're mentally representing the information on the page in your mind. It's not the objective information that determines your decisions. It's the way you mentally represent it. You operate in here, not out in objective reality. Sometimes unfortunately, right? But it's what, it's what you perceive that counts. So the gist is this vague bottom line meaning. It's a function of everything you are as a person. So it's a function of your culture, your educational background, all of that goes into it. And this is based on a lot of research on narrative and psycholinguistics, et cetera. So you extract this meaningful interpretation, usually multiple gist representations, in parallel with this exact surface form. What happens to the exact surface form? It, it becomes rapidly inaccessible. Usually you're left with the gist after even 48 hours, it's mainly gist at that point. And we can bring that verbatim back with cues, but you get the idea. And this just verbatim kind of uh, duality uh, also has been applied to interpretation of graphs, interpretation of pictures. Any meaningful stimulus is encoded in these two different ways. So these two different kinds of representations also um, support different kinds of processing. So the exactness of verbatim representation supports the ability to make exact analytical calculations, this kind of precise. Kind of, kind of processing, whereas the gist supports this fuzzy, parallel, impressionistic kind of thinking that occurs um, in everyday life typically and in reasoning problems. So the, the picture of the trees there is because the analogy is the forest for the trees. The verbatim is more focusing on the trees and the details of each leaf, and the, and the gist is standing back and seeing the whole forest. So if you get information, this is you're in the doctor's office, this is real information about a real vaccination, and vaccination is a, is a fascinating topic for a lot of reasons. Uh, the, the doctor says that you know, children of parents who refuse this vaccine are 23 times more likely to get the disease, um, and you can encode 23 times more likely, whatever that means, right? It depends on what the risk was, but okay. Or you can say, wow, that's a huge increase in risk. I better get vaccinated, and that would be the difference there. All right. So what about individual differences? Well, as we talked about before, you know, different people from different walks of life, people at different ages, they lean on different kinds of mental representations to different degrees. And aging has an effect on verbatim versus just memory. We've shown in modeling that we've done with both normal aging, mild cognitively impaired people, and those with Alzheimer's disease and other kinds of of uh, impairments, that uh, verbatim tends to be differentially lost as a result of so-called healthy aging. And when you lose the gist backup, that gist memory, which you have conserved most, mostly in normal aging, so you don't experience this tremendous functional decline. But when you lose that backup system, that's when the decline becomes more profound. Um, and that's what you see in mild cognitive impairment and in Alzheimer's disease. So, this is a little sort of mnemonic. Um, it's oversimplified, of course. But if we think about the top there as lower high gist uh, capacity or ability or reliance and verbatim lower high, as you can see, the young adult is at the pinnacle of information processing. They can call on a very accurate verbatim memory as well as being able to extract and retain the gist. 
On the other hand, folks in aging up there in the upper right are low verbatim high gist, so their information processing is more geared toward relying on the gist even more rather than the details. Folks with autism are a kind of the opposite example, and I'm gonna show you a kind of critical test of that. Autism, we argue, based on a lot of people's work, and this is very similar to weak central coherence kinds of hypotheses of autism, is a different kind of information processing that's mainly verbatim and literal as opposed to gist space. Now, when that's good for the processing, when you want to reduce certain kinds of heuristics and biases, folks with autism do better at the task than so-called neurotypical adults. But obviously, in many aspects of real life, we don't rely on the literal. We rely on the metaphorical, the gist, um, to negotiate through life. So that's like a little two by two. And Alzheimer's, obviously, is where you see uh, low levels of both and obviously profound influences on processing. All right, so what's happening across the lifespan? Let me give you a little data. You may recognize these words. Uh, these are the so-called Dees Rodiger McDermott lists. Just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Anyway, <laughs> so you present people with these kinds of lists of words, sour, candy, sugar, good, taste, too, et cetera. You never present the word sweet. Right? You never say that. Or you present, here's another one that has a health theme. I thought that would be appropriate. And then you know you do a small little buffer test, and you say, and you say, did I present good? Did I present taste? And people say yes. And you say, did I present sweet? And they say, yes, I remember it clearly. I can hear your voice saying it. You never said it. Now, why do people say that they heard something they never heard? This is called false memory. And they say that because they remember the gist in a very vivid way. The gist is normally repeated 15 times on this list. You know, sweet, sweet, sweet is firing off in your mind. Right? You never actually say it, but you're recalling these semantically related words. We've done the same work, by the way, with sentences and fit the same mathematical models with sentences and narratives. And again, just like with words, people extract the surface form, the actual words that were presented, and in parallel, they get, there's a theme here, there's a theme here, hmm, sweet. Right? And they think, in fact, that they experienced it. Here's a, a recall across ages, so 5, 7, 11, and 20-year-olds. And as you can see, the verbatim memory for what was actually presented, the words that were actually said, whether they recall them or not, that proportion correct goes up sharply over age. People get better at recalling what truly happened. But if you notice the false memory, and this is after you give very clear instructions, don't tell us sweet, that's wrong. Don't tell us the gist, the gist is wrong. Right? So you have to be very clear. Even after you give very clear instructions, you notice that goes up very rapidly, even more rapidly than memory for the items that were presented. So as you get older, you're more and more likely to say, sweet was on the list. That's an error. Right? That's wrong. But in fact, that very systematic, meaning-based error goes up with age. Now, if you notice, look at the difference over there on the right. That's a teeny tiny difference. See the, note the difference on the left? That's a big difference. So you're net more accurate when you're younger about what really happened than you are when you get older. This particular result, we initially uh, published this in 2002. It's since been, there's been 55 experiments since then, last I counted. Um, this was about 2011. 53 out of 55 showed this pattern. All right, and, mo and many of those people were highly critical of this result. They were sure it was an artifact, which was kind of cool. But anyways, but they replicated it in any way. And again, the notion here is that this tendency to be meaning-based, to approach your reality as meaning-making in parallel with ex in also encoding the reality of it, is something that becomes more and more robust with age. And there's also very interesting perceptual illusions that increase with age. You're more objective when you're younger, the Ebbinghaus illusion, for example, and other things. So this is across domains. So what happens in judgment and decision making across the lifespan? Well, and I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because I can see time is, is going. Um, <clears throat> so if you look at developmentally uh, reasoning and decision making biases, there's lots of reasons and almost every developmental theory other than fuzzy trace theory says you ought to get better with it from childhood to adulthood. Whatever the reasoning task is, whatever the Piagetian task, whatever the logical, re you ought to get better, better, better. Maybe you don't differ, but you know, if you differ, you ought to be, adults ought to be better than kids at these tasks. You're better at memory, you're better at metacognition, you're better at analysis, you're better at math, you know what I mean? You're better at everything, right? So you ought to see improvements. 
Well, um, there are many standard heuristics and, and biases paradigms, like the framing effect, the representativeness heuristics, availability heuristics. If you don't know what these are, don't worry. But basically, they're standard paradigms in judgment and decision making in which adults show errors. And the developmental pattern for many of this is that the kids are objective, they're logical, they're not biased. They're rational, right? And then as you get older, these biases and heuristics emerge. Not all of them. Some of them really are math problems, right? Those get better, right? But the ones that are due to semantic gist that we've analyzed in a number of ways, those increase with age. So you become more and more biased and irrational from this perspective with age, despite your ability to do better and better math. So, our explanation for this is that reliance on GIST increases with development. Again, we've done very, very specific process models, and I'm going to get to some specific evidence in a minute, in particular framing effects. And that's our explanation for this. So I'm going to go through that pretty fast. So how many people here have heard of the standard framing problem, like this dread disease problem? Raise your hand if you've heard about it. Most people have. OK. So you have, And you can do this with money. Same thing, right? You can say $100 for sure, or I flip a coin, and there's a 50% chance I get $200, 50% chance I get nothing. You know, If you're risk averse, you pick the sure $100 rather than the coin flip. Here you have uh, people are going to die. So people don't normally get the gain frame and the loss frame back to back like you're getting them. They get them separated, right? You have, a, you have for sure to save 200 people, or you can gamble, take a risk, one, and there's a one-third chance of saving all 600 people who are expected to die, uh, and a two-thirds chance of saving no one. The standard pattern of choices, by the way, what you can remember later, that's the gist if you encoded that fully. This is the gist. The simplest distinction you can make in terms of, um, of quantity is that there's some people or nobody, that there's some money or nobody. And then how do, the, how do the options come out if you think of them in the simplest kind of level? Well, you can save some people for sure, or you can take a chance, and you'll either save some people or you'll save no one. Gee, which is better, saving some people or saving no one? Saving some people, is that's my values for human life. Of course, saving some people. On the other hand, if I get the negative one, it's some people die for sure. I can gamble, and either nobody will die or somebody will die. Gee, nobody dying is much better than some people dying. Now I want to be a gambler. So this shift from risk aversion to risk seeking is explained by these simple mental representations. And the key explanatory prediction here is that you start at the simplest level, and you only make finer distinctions about the numbers and so on if you can't distinguish the options using this very simple all or none categorical gist. Then you move up to ordinal and so on and so forth if you need to. So we also took these tasks and we customized them for children. So we did prizes, we did stickers. One year we did uh, Super Bowls. You can have one Super Bowl for sure, and you can you know, spin a spinner and get 50% you know, chance of two Super Bowls and a zero of no Super Bowls. And we put a little empty Ziploc there. And Super Bowls were bouncing all over the school. So we tried stickers after that. They don't bounce. But <laughs> basically, you can essentially do this. You can, By the way, you, you can do spinners for the sure thing and for the gamble. It doesn't change the results. So you think, well, maybe kids like to gamble, so they want to play with the spinner. So you make an all-blue spinner, and blue wins, right? So that you can control for that. The results do not change. So the question is, then, what happens? Oh, and also, we present lots of decisions. There is nine gains and nine loss decisions within subject. We counterbalance blocks. Half of them get the gain first. Half of them get the loss first. You get the idea. Lots of controls for lots of things, three levels of risk, three levels of reward. What happens? Well. Preschoolers don't show any framing effect. About 70% of the time, they gamble for both gains and losses. So they don't gamble all the time. They respond to levels of risk. Why? They can see the areas of the spinner. This is before they can count. We had them count afterwards. They can't count. You know, they're like, OK, 5, 1, to by 17, they don't know. <laughs> you know, they're four, what do they know? So on the other hand, if you tell them, well, I gave you two cookies and I took away one cookie, and you know, why are you treating that differently than just giving you one cookie, which is a framing effect, they look at you like you're crazy. Like, lady, I have one cookie. 
right? I have one sticker. What's your problem? So they don't see, you know, but for an adult with the same exact choice, the fact that you used to have two and now you have one matters. It's how it's framed. It's the context of what you had a minute ago. And we act it out in front of them and so on. That makes no difference to the little kids. They're saying they're objectively identical. Why are you talking? Why are you, you know? So this has been replicated a number of times. What you see emerging with age is at, initially they're, they're indifferent. They treat the gains and losses objectively the same, right? Then you see this what's called reverse framing pattern, and you, you, you never see this with adults. Like two out of 102 adults will show reverse framing. Reverse framing is where you're risk seeking in the gain frame and risk uh, and, and go for the sure loss in a loss frame. Adults typically do not do that, but that usually means you're focusing on one dimension, namely outcomes, and comparing the magnitudes of them. So you see that around second grade to about fifth grade. Then in fifth grade or early adolescence, you see this emergence for the first time of the standard framing pattern, and that's when you're assimilating across the differences and seeing them as some versus none. And we have a number of tests of that. So. So if we, and we did another study with um, adolescents. So this is adolescents versus young adults, 153 of them, in which we had exactly the same sort of, of uh, choices, but they were hypo hypothetical money choices as opposed to prizes and stickers. By the way, the initial demonstration of the effect I just mentioned, where you have no framing, then reverse framing, then standard framing, that was done with an incentive compatible task in which the kids were told, we're going to pick one of these for sure, and you're going to really get it. Now, naturally, we did not disappoint the four-year-olds, because <clears throat> that would have been bad. But you know, uh, they did think that it, they were playing for real, for actual prizes. So this one is hypothetical, but the results are very similar. Um, here again, you have nine gain and nine loss problems. And what did adolescents do? And this was within subject. Again, gain first for half of them, loss first blocks for the other half. And what you see is for low amounts of reward, like winning $5 for sure, you see a standard framing pattern. This is percentage of people choosing that risky gamble, right? So the gain is in the blue and the loss is in the black. And this is within subjects, so you get an attenuated framing effect. Some people compare them, the two, and so we've averaged across that, so it's a smaller effect, but it's significant. It's bigger if you look at the first block. So for low rewards, you see this standard framing among these adolescents, these are high school students. As you go over to the high payoffs, you see exactly the same effect as I found in the earlier study, namely this reverse framing, where now you make the stakes big enough, expected value is still equal, but the differences in the outcomes are really big now, right? They're bigger than just $5 and $10. Imagine 50 and 100. Now we're $50 different. Hmm. So now you want to gamble in the gain frame more, and you, want, and you go for more for the sure loss. So, and then the question that is, so that's diagnostic of this looking more at the rewards kind of pattern and thinking about the differences between them, you know, and comparing that as opposed to saying, look, I'm going to win something, I'm going to win nothing and glossing over the quantities. Now, the question then is, how does this relate to real life? So I'm going to skip this in the interest of time because I'm just going to explain it to you. So lab to life. So the very same people who did this these high school students and young adults who did this laboratory task with gains and losses also responded to a number of self-report um, uh, surveys. And in, back in 2006, I did a review of the literature on adolescent risk taking, in which I discovered that the way we summarized that literature really wasn't quite what was in the literature. And this happens sometimes. It was not intentional, of course, on anyone's part. But you read paper after paper, and it, when, when adolescents were asked to estimate the risks and benefits of these risky choices, whether it's you know, getting in a car with someone who's drunk or you know, having unprotected sex or smoking or whatever, they tended to overestimate a lot of these risks. And when you looked at, but you looked at their estimate of risks and benefits, it tended to predict their behavior. Now, if their choices are impulsive, why is it predicting their behavior? It's as though they were actually considering the number of bullets and the amount of money. It's as though they were trading off risks and benefits, right? So, it, so in study after study, in domain after domain, there seemed to be evidence that adolescents were a little bit more verbatim as opposed to just. So on that basis, we thought if we got them in the laboratory, we diagnosed their information processing, could we then relate it to their real life risk taking? If we got something about how they thought, their ideation that suggested this reverse framing more quantitative pattern, was that related to risk taking? Like, could you actually relate that? There's a lot of reasons why this wouldn't work, right? But we were thinking maybe it would. 
So we obtained a lot of different measures of thinking, including categorical thinking about risk. This is sort of the opposite of counting the bullets and the amount of money. So it only takes once to get HIV, you know? That kind of thinking. Yes, I agree, disagree. It only takes once to get pregnant. Now, there's not a, this is not really quantitative thinking, right? This is not what probability theorists, they kind of go crazy and pull their hair out when they hear this. <laughs> In fact, there's an intervention that uh, Wendy Brundebrun and Baruch Fischhoff, who are you know, brilliant behavioral decision-making people, where they teach their t adolescents exactly the opposite. They say, this is an error. Don't think it only takes once. You know, what you should be thinking is how much risk, how much bent, yeah, really, right? <laughs> you know, and technically they're right, right? So technically this is wrong, but we said that's categorical all or none thinking. So we have a scale for that. We have a scale for just principles or values. These are you know, things like, um, you know, uh, uh, I have a responsibility to my partner to not get, you know, to not get her pregnant or things like that. Um, very simple basic values, uh, better safe than sorry, very simple kinds of things that people retrieve that guide their decisions. We had a global risk item. Uh, for you, having sex is which of the following in terms of risk? None, low, medium, high. That's it, globally, right? That, again, that shouldn't work, but it does. Um, for you, what are the benefits to have ha having sex? None, low, medium, or high. And if they didn't have sex, we said if you were to have sex, you know, so some of them are not sexually active, and so on. And then specific risks and, and, and very precise quantitative scales. What we've shown based on classic work going back to the intransitivity of preferences, all, and then subsequent work on different kinds of response modes, if you ask people for very precise response modes, like give me a number between zero and 100, or give me the exact number of dollars you would pay to rent that apartment, that you can no longer use some none gist. So you have to ratchet up your precision of the mental representation you use, and that change is responsible for a lot of these intransitivity of preference classic findings. So we use that to manipulate the kind of representation a person would use to answer the questions. And once again, just to give you sort of the bottom line, just like in false memory, you can get the same person to contradict themselves if you change the cue, because they're using a different mental representation. So they will tell you they're at low risk and they're at high risk. If they use verbatim and retrieve true memories about what they really did, they will say, I'm at high risk. If you get them to answer based on their perception of gist, they'll say, I'm a low risk, right? The same person within subject. So we manipulated the cues to make a long story short and the nature of the questions in order to tap verbatim thinking and gist thinking in the same person. So again, here's an example of one of the items. If you keep, this is the categorical thinking. If you keep having unprotected sex, risks will add up and you will get pregnant, all or none. You know, it's gonna happen um, and so on and so forth. So if you look at a factor analysis of these items, thank goodness, <laughs> things loaded very nicely. Um, so this is a you know, orthogonal principal components kind of analysis. The, the gist items all loaded together on one factor. Uh, the, the verbatim items all loaded, and if you can see there, framing loads in the opposite direction, so that means the more reverse framing you are on that dimension. And then you, we also think, again, like we said before, that reward sensitivity and impulsivity are important. We just wanna go beyond those explanatory constructs, but they're very important. So as you can see, sensation seeking and behavioral activation loaded on the same factor, which is mainly approach or the go system. The stop system is behavioral inhibition. That's fear of punishment. That loaded on its own factor, and that's an individual difference variable. And then just your overall tendency to gamble in the lab task. That's separate from whether you show framing. And in fact, it correlates zero. So your framing pattern, whether you reverse frame or standard frame, is different than just your tendency to be a gambler. That's a separate orthogonal measure. So we took these factor analytic scores, right, which are sort of purified, and we said, how did they predict real life self-reported risk taking? How did they predict, and remember we're talking like 15 and a half year olds for the adolescents, so initiating sex for them is a risky thing, and then number of partners, unprotected sex, all of that stuff. I'm only gonna show you some of them, but you get the idea. Sexual behavior, did, it pre did these five factors predict those and which predicted and which carried the most weight? Sexual intentions, which does tend to predict behavior, uh, number of partners, and so on. And as you can see, 
Just was, in fact, across all the analyses we did, just was always significant. This just factor always was significant, and it was always in a protective direction, meaning the, high, the more you agreed with categorical thinking, the more just your thinking was, the more, the, the less, the fewer partners, the lower your sexual intentions, the less likely you were to have initiated sex, and so on. And as you can see from the standardized beta weight, it's lower and it's negative. Um, age, of course, was correlated in this sample with behavioral inhibition. Your, your inhibitory ability went up steadily with age, just as many of the developmental theories, just as Galvan's and others would predict. Um, and that made your intentions and your, your, all of the sexual behavior goes up with age, so that tends to be increasing risk, and that's a pretty normal developmental trend. Sensation seeking was, in fact, it had separate unique variants associated with. The more sensation seeking you are, and that does peak in adolescence, and we had measures showing a curvilinearity in this sample. So in fact, the more sensation seeking, the more likely you were to have higher sexual intentions, more partners, and so on. And then re reverse framing, very interesting. The more you reverse frame, the more you wanted the sure loss in the loss frame, but gamble in the game frame, because you're looking at the differences in outcomes. The more tendency you had to do that, the more your sexual intentions, the more your risk taking. So again, and it accounted for unique variants. And gambling didn't do much. <laughs> so sexual intentions, so why, is, why would we say? So we're saying just based thinking, intuition, like a mature adults do, that's protective. That's going to make you a healthier person because you're not going to play Russian roulette. No, that won't come up too often. But, but HIV is sort of like Russian roulette, right? It's a very low probability, actually. If you were going with the odds on HIV, even for high-risk populations, if you calculate out the probability with multiple cumulative unprotected sex, the probability, the objective probability, I hate to say this, but the objective probability is actually low that you would get HIV. But should you have unprotected sex? Doesn't that seem a little insane? Right? It seems insane. That's the gist. And so we're saying, if you think about the odds and you count the number of bullets, that's not going to be very healthy. But if you think about these, and not all risks, right? Otherwise, you'd hide under your bed all the time. And that's not what we're saying. We're saying adolescents can have fun. You have it on tape. <laughs> but there are certain things that seem insane to, to mature adults. They have the insight that that's a crazy risk to take. And, and that's where we're coming from. All right, let's see. Ah, and we did look at the brain. We looked at this framing effects in the brain. And I wanted to talk about, since everybody has talked about the brain in such a, a compelling way, I figured I'd, I wouldn't just repeat some of the things they've already said about the limbic area of the brain and the prefrontal cortex. But there are other areas of the brain that turn out to be very important in gist. So this is looking at a framing greater than no framing uh, contrast in the brain. This is a whole brain analysis. It survives FWE, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And as you can see, you have activation that's um, particular in, when people frame, when people show this just like kind of thinking as compared to not, the superior parietal cortex is activated. And this is similar to a strategy that Venka Treyman et al. have identified and others called the PMAX strategy. And what that means is just your chance of winning something as opposed to nothing. Does this sound familiar? Right? So this is a just like kind of thinking that seems to be to preferentially involve the superior parietal cortex, usually pretty posterior in their studies. Ours is it extended all the way. But then we talked about, you know, what about indiv individual differences? That's the whole brain result, that this part of the brain is activating more if you're thinking in a more just like way. What about individuals? Do they show this? Well, as you can see here, if you look at individual scores in reverse framing, that's on the x-axis, and you look at the uh, beta values uh, for uh, the activation in the superior parietal cortex, the correlation is pretty high. So you can see that across individuals, the more and more they show standard framing, that framing behavioral pattern, the more and more activation they have in this part of the brain that we think is associated with this just strategy. So this gives us some confidence. It's not one or two subjects that are driving the group overall whole brain results. And again, the right superior parietal shows also a nice hefty correlation there too. All right, let's see. So. If you've all been listening very carefully, I know you have. You seem so wrapped. It's very nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Remember, we talked about that two, that two by two table, and we said, well, gee, you know, framing patterns normally indicate a kind of just thinking that's related to risk to lower risky decision making. It's it's in the brain, and also we said folks with autism are high verbatim low gist. So should they show framing effects? 
What would be our clear prediction here? Well, it turns out, and I'm just going to go past this because to the data, DiMartino et al. asked whether, in fact, they showed framing effects. So this is folks with Asperger's, which is not going to be used now, I guess, in the DSM now. It's mild autism now. But anyway, they were, they were sufficiently able to process the information and the problems. They weren't nonverbal, right? So these are mildly uh, um, autistic folks. Um, if you look on the right, these are just the same data plotted two different ways. On the right, you see this percent gambling in the gain frame in the, in the gray versus the loss. As you can see, the neurotypical adults show a nice framing effect, just like we showed before, more gambling in the loss frame than in the gain frame. But if you see over there on the right, the difference um, is smaller, there's a significant interaction for those with Asperger's, what they called Asperger's in the paper. So in fact, the folks with autism were more literal. They were not as influenced by frames. Their results resemble the younger kids in the uh, earlier couple of studies on the development of framing. So again, they were less biased. They've also been shown to be less, to show fewer conjunction fallacy effects and other kinds of biases. This is not the only effect in which folks with autism, in fact, are less impaired from the point of view of standard economic theory. Again, they're more literal, they're more objective, and in fact, in this case, they objectively then are not biased. Um, we've done models of the conjunction fallacy effect and these other things, and the bottom line is those are due to gist. There are semantic effects. This is why things don't add up to 100% exactly, because people are not being literal. They're thinking of the gist of categories when they're making these probability estimates. All right. So. Um, we can talk about autism and models of the brain. I'm, this is very much, I'm interested in your ideas of this. Um, <clears throat> we don't think that this kind of processing is just about specific locations in the brain, even the superior parietal, but it's more the question of connections. So in development, we make longer connections. Instead of these local connections, we make longer global connections in the brain. And that is, in fact, associated with, it's correlated with, at least, this kind of more gist-like thinking. And folks with autism tend to retain these smaller local, not, there's, there's shorter connections in the brain, not necessarily smaller, shorter connections, as opposed to these long connections. So we're thinking that that might be an interesting substrate for, for the nature of GIST processing. So once again, our two by two table, now we've filled in the different, I haven't told you about the Alzheimer's, but I can of course send you papers on that if you'd like. Um, and that's our conclusion. And I'm not gonna present this because we are running out of time, but I did another kind of test of the theory if people are interested. In. Thank you. So questions? Yes. Magically appears. Mm -hmm. um, maybe this isn't fair to ask you and but it, it was it was coming it popped into mind as I was listening. So one of the implications of this is that if you were modeling decision making, you know, in computer games and whatnot, mm -hmm. it seems to me that most of the um, the games that are used in JDM and and the kind of economic games that we heard about uh, yesterday, that they really are these kind of verbatim. Exactly. Um, I mean, heavily loaded that way because exactly. you you parameterize some aspect of the decision and then you sort of step through it at different levels and you mm -hmm. see how people it affects. Um, is this uh, is someone studying apples and someone studying oranges, or is there a way to use this really powerful methodology uh, to get at uh, the gist based uh, decisions as well? It's an excellent question. It's directly on point. And I recently finished a review of the literature on decision neuroscience in which I made this very claim. I said, if you if you don't measure if you don't measure gist, you're not going to find it. Right. So if, you, if not only do we make these tasks, we, we remove the meaning from them because, you know, as as Antoine Bouchara once said to me, I said, well, the Iowa gambling test is, you know, you know, let's look at transfer. And they he said, oh, no, you know, if you let them get the gist then they'll get it on the first trial, once they do one task, they immediately know what the point is. We can't have that. <laughs> so we got to control everything and make sure that they can't use their gist because that's all they do. <laughs> I said, exactly. <laughs> right. So obviously, if you and not only in these games, do you, it's hard to, you know, we make it impossible for there to be a gist, and we make it very verbatim, where you have to be verbatim to win. You also have to take risks. There's no safe option. There's no, how do I get out of this without risking and gambling? There's either gambling a little or gambling a lot. 
Those are your two choices. And it turns out, in many of these studies, guess who is scoring higher? So you compare kids to adults or older kids, the kids are actually winning more points. So we say, well, they're exploding those balloons and they're taking risks. Yes, and they're also winning, right? So they're scoring, they're doing the verbatim thing, the task you know, supports doing the verbatim thing. You gotta always know what your task is, right? And what, how you scored it. What, how do you win at this, right? So if you're more verbatim, just like the folks with, with uh, Asperger's, you'll do better at some of these tasks, depending on how you define the task. The question is, is life a video game? And I would submit some aspects of life, perhaps in the market, are a video, they are really a kind of clever math problem. Other things are more, wait a minute, Step back, there's something wrong here. This is a bad thing, you know? Don't gamble, period. No. Valerie? Oh. So I, I think yeah. these results are absolutely fascinating, Valerie. Um, I was, I was going to ask you, if possible, have you thought about placing these results in the context of the animal literature? So, I mean, there's this emerging literature that, for yep. example, <clears throat> Uh, a lot of apes and capuchin monkeys and tamarind monkeys show these framing effects that you're not finding in children, mm -hmm. you know, but then further back, like pigeons don't. So exactly. is, there, is there some integration that makes sense? Uh, you've done some really fascinating work on that too. That. <laughs> By the way, I love that paper. Um, yeah, I, I've been thinking about this for a long time. That's very, I think comparative work is underrated. We really need to think about the animal behavior literature and think about that in children and adults. And to me, it's all developed. You know, it's a kind of uh, comparative uh, thing, very informative. Reflection effects and framing effects are not exactly the same thing. Reflection effects are actually shown early in development. Years ago, I did the first study on that, and it's been replicated since. So if you're talking real losses and real gains as opposed to net gains, they're developmentally actually distinct. Now, this was a distinction, obviously, that Tversky and Kahneman made and so on. It kind of gets lost between reflection and framing because for adults, they're, not, they're sort of the same psychologically. But the difference between reflection and framing is reflection is about real losses. So if you're starving, you want variance, right? So just like foraging. Like if you're gonna lose, if you're gonna die for sure, take a risk, right? So objectively, that's different than if you're, you know, in, in a sweet spot situation where, hey, I could have more honey if I worked harder or I could just be fine. That, that's a, two objectively different situations. Reflection effects, loss aversion is present early. So you see loss aversion, but you don't see this, but you see gist. Emerging, So both of these are happening at the same time. Another interesting thing is there are many studies on, on um, various kinds of biases that show that animals are smarter than people. So optimizing is one of them. Probability matching was mentioned yesterday, so I, you know, and Dickie Hernstein, et cetera. So um, animals will optimize. So if you have two payoffs and, and one of them pays off 70% of the time, one pays off 30% of the time, the best thing to do is to pick the one that pays off 100% of the time, right? What do people do? They pick that 70% of the time. So so they don't ever do as well as 70%. What are they doing? They're testing hypotheses. So work by Gasmeyer, work by Wolford, work by other people has shown that it's the random part that's hard for people. They're saying, oh, I can figure it out. I know, what, I know what's going on. They're trying to connect the dots. They're trying to figure out what's the gist, only there isn't any. So they go for hundreds of trials trying to figure out what the meaning of all this is, and then they're systematically bad at it. Fascinating talk at many levels, and I, I have 100 questions, but I'm going to limit it to two right now. Um, mm -hmm. One is, I'd like you to comment on the implication of many of your examples is that GIST has a valuing component. It's not just the GIST of information, and, and I wonder if you've thought about getting the GIST of information versus this valuing implication in many, many of your examples, including mm -hmm. the, the Russian roulette. Uh, and then the second thing, which is a small detail, but I'm really curious for reasons I could say. It's, have you seen sex differences, particularly in the development and, gen and across adolescence in, in these? Yeah, I see some gender differences. They're not huge. They're not, it's not that, you know, for example, one gender shows reverse framing, the other, they both show the effects. Um, I think, you know, gender differences sometimes are not well motivated by theory, but in the sexual domain, that's not true. That there really are cultural differences and, and all kinds of other, you know, developmental differences, who develops when and what parts of the brain develop earlier in gender. So there really is a reason to think there might be gender differences. But it, it's, so I report them. It's it's not something that I've had, you know, a lot of theoretical expectations about. So, yeah. The prediction that the girls will show the shift to just base at that 11 to 13 earlier than the boys. 
That would make sense, wouldn't it? We have to have enough subjects to look at that. I, I will look at that. That makes sense. And valuation is another interesting thing. Valuation means so many different things to so many different people. You know, when you say valuation to economists, it means one thing. So um, I think you're absolutely right. And I think connecting this to values in the old sense of that term, like people's values, uh, more explicitly and with affect, which is valence, the connection between valence and values and emotion, I think is extremely important. And that's something I'm working on now. Okay, um, I actually had a very similar question, but my, you said something early on that, was, that really caught me, that you said retrieving values in context, and I thought mm -hmm. that was so fascinating. And so is the idea that people who have moved to just based able to retrieve those in every domain, or how, how, how flexible is that? Is yeah. that in different contexts? Yeah, it's and I know you've talked about context in a very interesting way in the brain, and that sort of thing is needed in terms of neuroscience. People don't talk a lot about context, but it's very important. Um, you know, in many for for many years, we said in development that you know reasoning and decision making was all domain specific. How do we know? Well, we just said it. People asserted it, and they asserted it because certain global theories had not panned out, like Piagetianism or whatever. But obviously, that's illogical, right? Because one theory doesn't quite explain everything. Therefore, there is no theory that explains it. That's not logical, right? So. On the other hand, there is something to be said for content, and just in embodies content. It's not just an abstract structure, like an algebraic structure you have in your head that's content free, right? So it's the gist of something. So it's you know the gist of a recipe is different than the gist of you know your husband. That's like not the same content, right? So it's the content that in fact is the difference, right? So the question is, how domain general is that? What we've shown in, in the work we've done, but there's plenty more to do, but what we've shown so far is you can become more and more automatic at capturing the gist from a varied surface form. So life comes at you in totally different ways. You know, If you're a doctor in medical school, you study patients, you'll never see that exact patient. Right? If you're in school studying certain principles, it won't be that exact set of principles that will recur if you study history. Right? You have to make an analogy from that. So it's never the same surface form, but do, just do repeat. History does repeat itself right? below the surface. The gist is the same. But then it's a separate mechanism to retrieve your values. That turns out it's additional variance. It's a whole other set of skills. So I got the gist, I'm done. No, you're still not done. You have to. You have people have to be trained to automatically come up with the, their values and apply it to that gist. That's a whole. That's a set of skills, and it's the opposite of the usual kind of public health approach we would take. Instead of deliberating and reflecting, the, uh, okay, you're in a stressful emotion situation. So think about it. Not good. Count the bullets. Not good, right? So what you really want is, OK, decide ahead of time, what are my core values in this situation, my top three, right? And then get real automatic about retrieving them. Boom, I get it. This is one of those situations. This is going to turn out bad. You know, it, where you immediately have that intuition rapidly. So that automaticity is something you build with skill as repeatedly recognizing it in different guises, retrieving it and applying it. It's sort of, I, I make the analogy of troops in battle. You want to train troops in battle when bullets are flying, not to be reflecting and deliberating, but to automatically retrieve what they need to do to save themselves. I had, I had one question. This will be our last question. Um, this is very similar to the questions that were just asked. I'm wondering, um, if gists are formed from content, um, how do we, how do gists that may compete with one another interact in the adolescent brain? So I think especially with the context of sexuality education or um, risky sexual decision making, mm -hmm. what, how do gists compete and, and how do adolescents respond to competing gists? That's a great question also, and I hope you all go out and do lots of related work so I can learn from it. Um, we, there's some work on, on competing or battling gists, and that's often, you know, if you think about the political dialogue, that's a really good real life example of here's a set of facts, here's two gists, at least two gists that compete for your attention of which one captures the facts. So you, what we've shown developmentally in a number of tasks is that you start off being kind of literal early, then it becomes competing gists. It's which gist is the right gist. And you might, you know, both just apply 
but one of them is appropriate to the task at hand and one is not. And that ability to then decide to suppress the interference from the other way of looking at the information, it's like an embedded figures test almost, right? You gotta suppress that alternative gist in order to go with the one that actually is what the task is about. That's again a separate kind of insight that comes with development. So I think you're exactly right. So, so the, the, the interesting thing about gist is you can't have it for someone. Right? You, you can't have insight, you have insight, and you're gonna tell them, I have insight, listen to me. That's mindless, right? That's just say no, right? That doesn't work, they have to have the insight. So there's where you get at these deep questions, and some of the students were saying some really fascinating things about this yesterday, I hope they pursue their ideas, but about experience and just, where does that insight come from? It comes from life, it comes from experience. What does that mean, right? We need to really explore where do these competing just come from and how do you eventually gain the insight that this is the appropriate one for the task and that one is not. <laughs>